Hey friends, welcome to our time of worship this morning. One of the things that this quarantine has afforded us is an opportunity to worship in new, different, strange ways. We're really excited about that. Friends, we want to thank you for coming out this past Wednesday to our prayer and Eucharist service. It was such a joy, such a blessing to see all of you. Thank you for helping us be obedient to all that the health department has asked of us right now. We couldn't have done that without you. It was, again, great to be together. And with that said, we want to make sure you're marking your calendars for our next outdoor, um, socially distanced and masked uh, prayer and Eucharist service, which will be on August 12th, again, out on our lawn here at Christ UMC at 7 p.m. Be on the lookout for more details. Friends, so pull up a couch, get ready to worship as we gather together in our own homes to praise the one who calls us together, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Story Camp, Chapter 3, The Wild Wood. I don't know how wild this wood is, but here I am out in the woods behind uh, the church. And uh, I have my toboggan hat on, uh, not because I'm cold, but because today's story is, uh, today's chapter is supposed to take place in the wild wood in the snow. So I couldn't reproduce snow this summer, uh, but I thought I'd wear my hat just to remind us what season we're in in chapter three, The Wild Wood. The mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the badger. He seemed by all accounts to be such an important person, though rarely visible. But whenever the mole mentioned his wish to the water rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the rat would say. Badger will turn up some day or other. He's always turning up, and then I'll introduce you, the best of fellows. Um, couldn't you ask him here, dinner or something, said the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Badger dislikes society and invitations and dinners and parties and all that sort of thing. 
Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat. He's so very shy. It's quite out of the question also because he lives smack dab in the middle of the wild wood. He'll be coming along someday. Just wait patiently. Now, in the winter time, the rat slept a great deal, retiring early and rising late. During his short days, he sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic jobs about the house. And of course, there were always animals dropping in for a chat. Consequently, there was a good deal of jolly storytelling. This, however, left Mole with a good deal of spare time on his hands. And so, one afternoon, when the rat in his armchair before the fire was alternately dozing and trying over rhymes that just wouldn't rhyme, he formed the resolution to go out by, him, by himself and explore the wild wood and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon with a hard, steely sky overhead when he slipped out of the warm parlor into the open air. With great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on toward the wild wood which lay before him low and threatening. Then what seemed like faces began. It was over his shoulder and indistinctly that he first thought he saw a face looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things or there would simply be no end to it. But, but then what he thought was pattering of feet began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first, so slight and delicate was the sound. Then suddenly the pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed to be running now hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round him. In panic, he began to run too, aimlessly. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, he darted under things and dodged round things. At last he took refuge in the deep dark hollow of an old beech tree, which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety, but who could tell? And as he lay there panting and trembling and listened to the patterings outside, he knew it at last in all its fullness, that dreaded thing which other little dwellers in fields and hedgerows had encountered here and known as their darkest moment, that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, from the terror of being lost in the wild wood. Now, meantime, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozing by the fire, his paper of half-finished poems slipped from his knees, his head fell back, his mouth opened, and he wandered by the green banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped, the fire crackled and sent up a spurt of flame, and he woke with a start. Remembering what he had been engaged upon, he reached down to the floor for his poetry, poured over it for a moment, and then looked round for the mole to ask him if he knew a good word to rhyme with this or that. But the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly, several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg. His galoshes, which always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find the mole's tracks. He could see the imprints of them in the mud, running along straight and purposeful, leading directly to the wild wood. 
The rat looked very grave and stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, took up his stout walking stick that stood in the corner of the hall and set off for the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. And all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's, it's old rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more when at last to his joy, he heard a little answering cry. Guiding himself by the sound to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it. And from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow and there he found the mole exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried. I've been so frightened, you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. Now then, said the rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together and make a start for home while there's still a little light left. It will never do to spend the night here, you understand. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly, or rather down, it's snowing quite hard. The mole came and crouched beside him, looking out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite a changed aspect. Well, well, it can't be helped, said the rat after pondering. We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. The worst of it is, I don't know exactly where we are, and now this snow makes everything look so very different. We shall have to make a push for it and do something or another. The cold is too awful for anything, and the snow will be soon too deep for us to wade through. So they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. When suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, poor old mole, said the rat kindly. You aren't having much luck today, are you? I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. He pondered a while and examined the snow-covered humps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in the pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored, all four legs working busily while the mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals, Come on, rat! Suddenly, the rat cried, hooray! And then, hooray! And fell to executing a feeble little jig in the snow. What have you found? asked the mole. There, there, exclaimed the rat in great triumph. Look at that! It was a doormat. Well, now, said Mole, you seem to have found a piece of litter someone threw away. Can we eat a doormat or sleep under a doormat or sit on a doormat and sledge home over the snow on it? Do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the Mole, I think we've had enough of your folly. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything? They simply don't do it. They're not that sort at all. Doormats know their place. Now look here, replied the rat. This must stop, not another word. Just get to scraping. Scrape, scrape, scratch, dig, and hunt if you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for this is our last chance. 
Some 10 minutes hard work and the point of Rat's walking stick struck something that sounded hollow. In the side of what had seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid looking little door painted a dark green. An iron bell pull hung by the side and below it on a small brass plate neatly engraved in square capital letters they could read by the light of the moon, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backward on the snow from sheer surprise and delight. Rat, he cried in penitence, you're a wonder, a real wonder. That's what you are. At once together, they rang the bell and hammered on the door until from inside they heard footsteps. Let's talk a little bit about what we're learning here in chapter three before we end our time together. First off, let's talk about the kingdom of God. We've learned about friendship, we've learned about loyalty, um, and we see even more of that in this chapter. We certainly uh, see the friendship between Molly and Rat deepening, uh, their friendship, their care for one another, um, and we see their loyalty playing out even more. Uh, Molly uh, heads out uh, towards the Wildwood to try to meet Mr. Badger uh, against Ratty's um, instructions, uh, and he gets lost. Um, and when Ratty realizes this, he doesn't even think about himself. He gets himself dressed, gets his walking stick, and heads right out to find uh, Molly uh, to rescue him. And uh, that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus is our rescue plan, uh, God's rescue plan for us. We get ourselves lost sometimes, don't we? When we do things our way instead of God's way. And I'm so thankful that Jesus is our friend that Jesus is a loyal friend, that Jesus comes out and finds us no matter what. Jesus is our helper. Um, and we see uh, this kingdom of God idea in chapter three. Let's talk about homes. Um, let's talk about homes. I love uh, in this story that the thing that um, rescues them uh, once they're um, back out in the woods together, uh, Molly and Rat, is a welcome mat, right? Maybe you have a welcome mat out in front of your uh, one of your doors to your home. Uh, welcome mats are just that. They're oftentimes they say welcome right across from them. It's a way that we let people know that we like welcoming people into our home. You are welcome to come in, to sit down. Maybe we'll share a meal together. It is good for our homes to be welcoming. Jesus is of course so welcoming to us. Jesus welcomes us into God's kingdom, into God's home. Let's talk about nature again. Here we see a different season. We started in the spring, uh, then we had some uh, chapter two was in the summer, and here we are um, into winter. Seasons are such an important uh, part of our lives. We have different seasons in our spiritual lives too. We have seasons where uh, we're learning new things about who God is and what God's doing. And we have times where we sort of curl up and get small and we're just patiently waiting uh, for the work uh, that God promises God will do in our lives. So it's nature's a wonderful way of teaching us about what living a life with God is like. And then finally, transformation, right? As disciples, we are called to live transformed lives, changed lives. And uh, I wanna read to you from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, Molly walked through a dark valley, didn't he? He got lost. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, here's the good part. I will fear no evil for you are with me. You're with me, Jesus. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Ratty had his walking stick and that's what he used to find uh, the mat, isn't it? 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just like Raddy went after Mole, God's love through Jesus will come after us to find us, to rescue us. Great thoughts. Let's think about that this week. Know you're loved, know you're appreciated, and know that you're prayed for. All right, bye. -bye. section of the Psalms called the Songs of Ascent. These Psalms, we said, are designed to help people 
I help the disciple prepare for worship. They help us to focus on godly traits. So far, we've talked about perseverance. We said that perseverance describes an intentional life focused on taking that next step of faith as we move from today right directly to the throne room of God. Next, we talk about hope, right? Our hope is rooted in the work that Christ has already done on our behalf. Hope, combined with expectation and trust, reveals Jesus at work amongst us. Last week, we talked about service. We said that the disciples' life of service is described as living in the presence of God while reflecting God's glory in all that we do. This week, our topic is happiness. Happiness is an interesting word in 2020. Its definition has been muddied with selfish desires, with world interpretations, with tempting hopes, and instant gratification. The truth is that the world struggles with happiness. Because of this, defining happiness can cause a rub in our lives. But here's what we do know. We know that we were created in the image of God to love and to worship God and to be in relationship with both God and with our neighbor. Happiness occurs when we fulfill that purpose. Our psalm for today is Psalm 128, so let's take a look at it. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy, and it shall go well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. As we read this psalm, it is clear that happiness is an extension of our relationship with God. The psalm opens with three direct descriptive promises. First, Happy is everyone who fears the Lord. Right? Last week, our psalm began with a direct directive for us to look up to God. We said that if God is a God worth following, then God must be a God that we look up to. This week, the psalmist uses the word fear. This is not a cower in the corner type of fear, but it is a respect or honor or reverent posture before God. You see, when the psalmist describes us as fearing God, he is making a reference to the fact that we are not God. He's referencing that we look up to God for wisdom and direction, and we are servants of God who engage at God's command. One scholar writes this. He says, the Bible isn't interested in whether we believe in God or not. It assumes that everyone more or less does. What it is interested in is the response that we have to God. Is God a buddy or a pal? Or is God the one who redeems all creation? Happy is the one who fears the Lord. The second directive it says is that you shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands. This is the promise, right? Should you fear the Lord, you will be faithful or fruitful. You should also be faithful. But if you fear the Lord, you shall be fruitful. When we are in good relationship with God, and when we are digging deep as disciples, God's promise is blessing. Now friends, this is a tale as old as time, right? We see it right from the very beginning of the book of Genesis, in the garden story, in Joseph's tale, in Abraham's promise. Each time these disciples dig into their discipleship, each time they long to love God more and more, we see God's blessing in their life. In each of these stories, God says that if you love me, you will be blessed. And if you don't, then you will have to work really, really hard to find blessing. You shall be happy, and it shall go well with you. The third directive. You shall be happy, and it shall go well with you. He says those who fear the Lord will be happy. Right? That's the good news. When we love God, we inherit God's blessing. But there's also room for more. You see, the more we love God, the more we realize God's blessing. 
Hear that. The more we love God, the more we realize God's blessing. It's not that God blesses any one of us more or less, but the more that we are in relationship with God, then the more we realize God's role in our lives. Friends, this is why our discipleship process is so important. This is why Pastor Kerry and I talk about this so much, right? The more we seek to be in relationship with God, the more we are aware of God's role in our life. Two things I hope we notice from this section. First, that happiness and blessing form a cause and effect relationship between us and God. The more we seek God, the more blessing we will notice. The more we turn from God, the farther away God's blessing will seem. Second thing I hope we notice is that discipleship is not a reduction of what we already are. Our discipleship will expand our capacities and fill us up with life so that you and I, so that we can overflow with joy. The second section of our psalm gives an illustration for how blessing and happiness work. The underlying premise is that we are blessed or are happy when we, you and I, have the ability to increase our capacity, right? We are blessed or we feel happiness when we are blessed more. Hear that again. We are blessed but we feel happiness when we are blessed more, right? I have a $5 bill and I will feel happier when I have a $10 bill. But now we need to be careful because we're starting to enter into a sticky situation, right? We have to be careful here that we don't move into a prosperity gospel kind of story. The difference between a prosperity gospel and our happiness scale is that the prosperity gospel says that the more you love God, the more that God loves you. Now, friends, that should give you the heebie-jeebies. It should sound a little funny, right? Because our happiness scale says that God already loves us unconditionally. The more we love God, the more we notice God's love for us. It's not that God loves us more. It's that we realize God's love in our lives. The more we invite God into our lives, the more that we notice God at work in us. You see, friends, the truth is this. We are inseparable from God, right? God loves us unconditionally. God never stops working in us. But the more we pay attention to God, the more of God's work we notice in us. The psalmist gives us a couple of examples of how, uh, of this, God working in our lives through a Hebrew context, right? Both the vine and the olive tree were staples in the Hebrew economy. The psalmist says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. In the Jewish home, a sign of blessing was a large family, right? The next generation is, has some security. For the vine to be fruitful, the farmer must carefully tend to the vine and continually encourage its growth. He goes on to say, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Right? Olive shoots take a lot of patience to tend and to care, but the efforts are rewarding. It takes about 40 years before an olive shoot will produce fruit. Finally, he says, thus the man shall be blessed who fears the Lord. Notice that the blessedness of the man is captured in how well he cares for his household. Right, It's all about a strong relationship with God, with family, and of course, with himself. Each of these relationships are crucial if we ex expect to live into God's blessedness. Friends, this should not be new news for us, right? The lawyer asked Jesus for the key to eternal life, and he said, Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. At the center of these relationships is a love for ourself. We are God's children, we are God's creation. We are redeemed by God's love, and we are secured in God's hope. When we embrace our love for God, for neighbor, and for self, we notice more and more of God's blessing in our life. And when we notice more of God's blessing in our life, our worldview changes, our interactions change, our goals are different, right? This does not, of course, exempt us from difficulties, but it does give us the assurance of victory. No matter what happens, 
Jesus already claims victory. No matter what happens, we have already won. Right? No matter what happens, we should prepare for the heavenly feast. Before we leave this section, there's one thing that I also think is worth noting. This blessedness or this relationship with God is available to everyone. Right? At Christ Church, we know this. This truth is part of our discipleship process. Jesus gives us an invitation, right? For 12, Jesus called them by name. For the masses, Jesus invites us, you and I, into the Christ story, right? Jesus gives us an invitation. He says, let the children come to me. Or he says, let those who are weak and heavy laden come. When we call upon his name, Jesus answers. Every time we stand face to face with Jesus, you and I, we are sent away with a blessing, a healing, a new outlook, a redeemed sin, a new belly. Every time we encounter Christ, friends, we are blessed. This blessedness or relationship with God is available to all people. All we have to do is just say yes to Jesus. This, again, is why the very first relationship question in our baptismal vows is this. Do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord? So our psalm closes with the psalmist proclaiming four blessings over Israel. First, the Lord bless you from Zion. Right, Zion is both the heart of the Jewish people and the promised glory of the Jewish nation. From the very core of God's people, he says, may you be blessed. Second blessing, may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Jerusalem is the city that holds the Jewish identity. It's their place. It holds their place as the chosen people of God. The psalmist says, may they prosper. May God prosper. And may they retain their chosenness. Third blessing, may you see your children's children. He says, may there be longevity in your generations and never without hope. Finally, peace be upon Israel. Peace. True peace can only be achieved as we live in perfect relationship with God. Peace is God's promise for the believer. Peace is God's promise for the disciple. Let peace be Israel's victory song. Friends, as we get ready to leave this psalm, I pray that you will embrace the discipleship implications outlined here. First, receive the truth, right? Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Second, be transformed by the promise, right? The more we are in relationship with God, the more we realize God's role in our lives. And finally, will you respond in your blessedness? We were created in the image of God to love and to worship God and to be in relationship with our neighbor. Happiness occurs when we fulfill our purpose. Friends, in this next week of our coronavirus quarantine, I pray that you will continue to be safe, to practice good social distancing habits, and that you will care for one another from a distance. Please be sure to spend time with the prayer focus sheets and remember to send in your tithes so that we can continue to do good work as God's people. Friends, may you be blessed. Amen.
This is Gabriella Wilson. I want to say thank you for joining us in our worship experience today. I know that staying home is difficult, especially when we want to be together, but we know that God is walking with us no matter where we find ourselves today. During this quarantine, one way that I have seen God at work in my home is through employment. Um, I managed to get a job back in April and I've been working steadily throughout the quarantine. Be blessed as you find comfort this week in these words adapted from Jen Pollock Michael. Dear Lord, for the sick and infected, God, heal and help. Sustain bodies and spirits. Contain the spread of infection. For the vulnerable, vulnerable populations, God, protect our elderly and those suffering from chronic disease. Provide for the poor, especially the uninsured. For the young and the strong, God give them necessary caution to keep them from unwittingly spreading this disease. Inspire them to help. For our local, state, and federal, go federal governments, God help our elected officials as they allocate the necessary resources for combating this pandemic. Help them to provide more tests. For our scientific community, leading the charge to understand the disease and communicate its gravity, God give them the knowledge, wisdom, and a strong voice. For those with mental health challenges who feel isolated, anxious, and helpless, God provide them with every necessary support. For the homeless, unable to practice the protocols of social distancing in the shelter system, protect them from disease and provide isolation shelters in every city. For all God's children, may we take comfort in the arms of the Lord. Have a great week.